itself and also covering some tips for responding uh, after you get a, a notification of revise and submit for, for your manuscript and you get all kinds of feedback, feedback from reviewers. So tips for how to respond to those. I will say, although the second half of this session is designed primarily for uh, less experienced authors, I think the whole session is useful for everybody. So I invite you to stick around for the whole thing. Okay, so let's get going. First, um, we are the official journal of the Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association, and we are fully funded by the association. I think sometimes it's easy to overlook all the expenses involved in maintaining the academic journal, and I'm grateful that CCPA fully funds us. Anyway, this makes the association and all of us who are members of the association the primary stakeholder for the journal, and that's reflected in our aims. We have four primary aims, contributing to the advancement and improvement of counseling practice and the counseling profession. Uh, really a primary focus of the articles that are published within our journal are uh, related to counseling practice, the profession of counseling, and to advance knowledge, to advance and improve practice in the field. Second aim is to provide a Canadian forum for the dissemination of scholarly information on contemporary theory, research, and practice in counseling. In fact, our journal is the only Canadian journal that addresses counseling and psychotherapy as a whole, rather than specific parts. Third, uh, our, our aim is to act as a catalyst for critical analysis and scientific review and discussion within the discipline of counseling. Our uh, journal review process is designed so that articles that are published are high quality that, and engage with the field and permit consideration, permit analysis of the current state of things within the field and where things can and maybe should be going. And finally, uh, uh, we have an aim of increasing understanding of individuals, groups, and Canadian society about the practice and profession of counseling. So part of our audience, part of our mandate is to speak to folks who are outside of academia, who are outside of practice, the general public. And for this reason, we make our, our articles open access after a 12 month embargo. We hope that by doing so, uh, folks who are outside of the field will come across publications and uh, that will help them to really get more of a sense of what our profession is all about. All right. Um, oh, and I should mention, 12-month uh, embargo, however, if you are a member of CCPA, you will get immediate access to the issues of the journal as soon as it's published. It's actually one of the benefits of membership. But if you're a member of the general public, then you can have to wait, or you will need to wait uh, 12 months, but will eventually be able to access all the information within our journal. It's just not quite as soon as individuals who are members of our association. All right, moving along. I just wanted to share with you some data for the journal's activities in 2021 to give you a sense of what happens in our, in our journal over the course of a year. Every year we publish four issues of the journal. And in 2021, uh, these issues contained 30 articles. 23 of them were regular length articles that went through the full peer review process. I'll discuss more about that later on in the session. And seven were shorter book review articles that go through an abbreviated um, peer review process. All right. So, oh, I also wanted to mention among these four issues were one special issue with five articles uh, addressing the scholarship of teaching and learning in counseling psychology. In Counseling Psychology, and um, I wanted to thank the guest editors who led that uh, special issue, Drs. Robert Ruffley, uh, Tufi Luft, and Jill Cummings. Also in 2021, we received 50 new manuscript submissions and of course continued on with the publication process for many other manuscripts that were submitted in previous years. In fact, in any year, a majority of the articles published in that year were initially submitted in prior years. Looking now at the ratio of accepted manuscripts versus rejected manuscripts, 
and setting aside all the manuscripts that remained within the review process by the end of 2021, the acceptance rate for our journal in 2021 was 20%. And that's fairly typical. Every year it's around 20%. By the way, I should mention that these numbers include the book review articles and the acceptance rate for those is somewhat higher. So in effect, if you're submitting a regular article, like a research study or a conceptual piece or um, something like that, then um, the acceptance rate is actually a little lower than 20%. Moving right along, the final bullet point, I wanted to acknowledge that we had 94 people serving as peer reviewers for the journal in 2021. All their names are published in the final issue of the year. Um, and really, CJCP as a journal could not function without these folks. Many of them do multiple reviews for us in any given year, and they're all of, the, of them are doing this on a volunteer basis. So I'm grateful for the contribution to the field if you are um, watching this and are a reviewer for us. I should mention as a side, I say uh, volunteer and for the most part that is true. However, um, CCPA does explicitly identify review work as a professional writing activity for continuing education credit purposes. Most of our reviewers don't take us up on this, but uh, when asked by CCPA, I do provide confirmation to the association of the number of reviews completed for anybody who wants to use this activity uh, to count towards their CECs. Also, before we move on, I wanted to mention something about the number of submissions in related to the number of people doing reviews. So when you see 50 new submissions and 94 people doing reviews, it sounds like we have a lot of reviewers. But you need to remember that each manuscript that we, re that we receive is reviewed by multiple people, and most manuscripts have to go through multiple rounds of review before they are accepted for publication. So in reality, 94 people is not that many, uh, given the volume of work uh, that's involved. I'm going to raise the issue of um, the how many reviewers we have and our need for new, re new reviewers again when I discuss plans for the future. But before we talk about the future, I wanted to mention a couple of changes that we've made to the journal over the past couple of years, which will be useful for authors to be aware of. First, uh, back when APA published the seventh edition of their publication manual, we changed our policies to comply with that. This is you know, fairly standard across academic journals, but I wanted to highlight a couple of implications of shifting to seventh edition APA style. The seventh edition of the publication manual has an entire chapter devoted to journal article reporting standards for different kinds of research. So, you know, whether you're doing qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods research, if you're submitting a manuscript that is reporting on a study, it's important for your manuscript to comply with these new standards, the journal article reporting standards. And they are somewhat different for how you might have written up your studies in the past, even studies that had been published with us in the past. Uh, one particular area is the expectations for what uh, the structure of what a qualitative uh, study will look like. Um, in any case, uh, please do review the journal article reporting standards, chapter three of the seventh edition uh, APA publication manual, if you're not familiar with the content of that. The um, uh, publication manual also contains a fairly detailed section on plagiarism, which you know, contains content that most of us are familiar with, but it also addresses self-plagiarism, which some authors seem to be less aware of. At least over the time that I've been the editor of the journal, virtually every instance where I've had to reject a submission due to plagiarism, it's because the author has reused their own previously published work without proper attribution. Anyway, please become familiar with the APA style rules around self-plagiarism, and please be careful when you're creating multiple manuscripts from a common source document. I really don't have, want to have to call you out for accidentally plagiarizing yourself. Okay, moving to the next bullet point. Uh, the journal now, one of the changes that has happened in the past couple of years is that the journal now provides DOI information for all articles, and much more importantly, we register those DOIs with the Crossref system. 
This makes your articles much more easy to find when somebody is doing an online search. And combined with our open access policy, this will increase the likelihood of scholars finding, using, and citing your article in their own future publications. So that's a good thing. Uh, third, we now have automatic integration of information from our articles with ORCID and Google Scholar. Shortly after publication, your article will appear and, and all the fields will be populated into your ORCID and or your Google Scholar profiles without you having to do any manual updating. And that's just makes life easier for all of us who uh, publish and are scholars. All right, finally, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have experienced substantial delays in getting manuscripts to publication. The process of from initial sub submission through to publication has slowed down. Now, there are a lot of reasons behind this, but one of the reasons is the review process itself. And I have implemented numerous changes to try to get us back on track. Right now, we're not accepting any new proposals for special issues. So it's true that special issues have guest editors. But despite this, um, publishing a special issue takes more time and energy to complete than uh, regular issues. So putting a pause on those, once we get back on track in terms of the um, review process, uh, I'll begin considering special issue proposals once more. Another um, measure that we've put in place to streamline the review process, we used to uh, require three peer reviewers for every round of review that a manuscript goes through. We still have three reviewers required for an initial submission, but uh, for subsequent rounds of reviews, we have dropped this down to two peer reviewers. This will uh, save time in terms of completing the review process. And especially if your manuscript is about a topic or uses a research method that is relatively uncommon in our field. Um, when that happens, we often have difficulty finding qualified reviewers and therefore the review process can extend much, much longer than I would like. For the next streamlining measure, we used to permit manuscripts to go through uh, the revise resubmit process an unlimited number of times. And you know that obviously slowed things down for the authors and for us. It ate up review time and it also resulted in somewhat lengthy delays at time between when a study was done and when it was published, assuming it actually did make it to publication. Anyway, at present, our default policy has changed. We will end the, the review process after the second round of review. All right, so if it's not ready after it's been uh, revised and reviewed and revised twice, um, then it, I don't think it will be ready. I will say though, Occasionally, we do permit manuscripts to be revised and resubmitted for a third round if there's a compelling reason to do so. And typically, that would be, you know, one reviewer will, will be thrilled with, with this latest version, and another reviewer will still identify substantial amounts of problems with it after the two rounds. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, typically, if a, a manuscript is not ready for publication after the authors have tried to revise it a couple of times, it's probably not going to be ready for publication. Okay, uh, one other thing that we've implemented on the author's end of the review process is that you are no longer permitted to have an unlimited amount of time to complete the revise and resubmit process. And that, you know, um, that is to ensure timely publication, timely response, make sure that the reviewers who reviewed it in previous rounds uh, may be available to review the, the manuscript again. So we have um, we've have put a six month time limit on resubmission. And honestly, compared to other journalists in our, in our field, six months is still quite a long time for you to do the revisions and submit the changes. Um, plus we do um, consider requests for exceptions or extensions on that six month time limit. Uh, particularly if you have you know, health concerns or are, are on parental leave. Uh, but I guess the point is, if we have not heard from you after six months, and we do send a bunch of reminders toward, towards that six month mark, we will assume that you are not going to resubmit and we will automatically close your submission on our end of things. 
All right, so those are some changes to the journal processes and policies to streamline uh, the, pro the publication process. Moving right along. We haven't stopped there in terms of changes. We do plan on continuing to improve the uh, policies and processes um, in the upcoming year and probably eventually also in the future, but let's focus on changes that I'm hoping to implement in the upcoming year. First, I mentioned that um, current issues of the journal have DOIs attached to them. Well, my plan is to obtain DOIs for all our back issues, not just current and future issues. Now, we won't be able to add the DOI information onto the article PDFs themselves, but the DOIs will be in the journal archive page for your article. Uh, and more importantly, what this means uh, is that uh, when people are searching electronically for back issues, um, the DOIs will be associated with it uh, and uh, all the benefits for searching and finding your article uh, will apply to these back issues as well. All right, second, uh, continuing our efforts to get back on track with the manuscript review process, one of my major goals in this year is to recruit more reviewers. We've had quite a few of our long-term reviewers retire or otherwise become unavailable to conduct reviews over the last year or so. So we need more people to step in and serve as reviewers uh, despite the streamlining of the review process. Uh, yeah, so working on recruiting folks, and I'm also working on updating the procedures for becoming a reviewer. Right now, it's very cumbersome. Uh, the prospective reviewer has to fill out and submit a Word document, which then I have to review and then manually enter into the uh, reviewer database, and that's just not sustainable. I'm trying to figure out an alternative process where the um, application for review is automated or at least can be done mostly electronically and I'm just kind of reviewing the information that's entered into the system rather than you know getting a, a word document and having to retype everything that's submitted to the journal but until now I figured that out if you want to find out more about becoming a reviewer and you know you have a PhD or a strong background in conducting research that would allow you to evaluate the method sections of research studies please email me. I would love to follow up with you to explore the possibility of you joining our reviewer team. And uh, my email address is on the slide. Okay, moving on. 